Hi. Hello. We're in the Proclaimers book. We're in the chapter about how they came to be known as Jehovah's Witnesses. We're at the subheading Developments Pointing to the Name on page 152. It was in the 8th century BCE that Jehovah caused Isaiah to write, You are my witnesses, is the utterance of Jehovah, even my servant, whom I have chosen, in order that you may know and have faith in me, and that you may understand that I am the same one. Before me there was no God formed, and after me there continued to be none. And there's an ellipsis. You are my witnesses, is the utterance of Jehovah, and I am God. Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 12. As shown in the Greek, in the Christian Greek scriptures, many prophecies recorded by Isaiah have fulfillment in connection with the Christian congregation. Yet Isaiah 43, 10 and 12 was never discussed in any detail in the Watchtower during the first 40 years of publication. After that, however, their study of the scriptures directed the attention of Jehovah's servants to significant new developments. God's kingdom with Jesus as messianic king had been brought to birth in the heavens in 1914. In 1925, the year that this was made clear in the Watchtower, the prophetic command in Isaiah chapter 43 to be witnesses of Jehovah was given attention in 11 different issues of the magazine. In the Watchtower of January 1st, 1926, the principal article featured the challenging question, Who will honor Jehovah? During the next five years, the Watchtower discussed some portion of Isaiah 43, 10-12 in 46 separate issues and each time made application of it to true Christians. And then they have a list of all these references. Mm. In 1929, it was pointed out that the outstanding issue facing all intelligent creation involves the honoring of Jehovah's name. And in connection with the responsibility that Jehovah's servants have regarding this issue, Isaiah 43, 10-12 repeatedly came up for consideration. Thus the facts show that, as a result of study of the Bible, attention was repeatedly being drawn to their obligation to be witnesses of Jehovah. It was not the name of a group that was under consideration, but the work that they were to do. But by what name should those witnesses be known? What would be appropriate in view of the work they were doing. To what conclusion did God's own word point? This matter was discussed at a convention in Columbus, Ohio, USA on July 24 to 30, 1931. I have issue right away. It's not discussed. It was. At the convention. It's announced. It's announced. Yeah. They, they don't discuss things. They tell you what you're supposed to believe. I don't know whether the writer here, the writers of this particular section are aware of it, but inadvertently they've admitted the power of their propaganda. I, you, you say, on the one hand, you didn't really notice it, make, make anything of it for 40 years. That would be the entire 30 years of Russell's control. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years after that, under Rutherford, you didn't pay any attention to this, and all of a sudden it's everywhere. Do you yeah. not realize what you're admitting in making this contrast? Well, in, in the uh, second paragraph, it said uh, significant new developments happened at that time. And that is true because they, the, uh, the rest of that says God's kingdom with Jesus as Messiah King had been brought to birth in the heavens in 1914. Well, that's a new development. We don't think of it as witnesses, as a new development, because we think they always taught that, but they well, hadn't taught what's that. What's the truth? They, they taught that that had happened invisibly in 1878. Yeah. So yeah, this is new light. So you, you can kind of understand why two-thirds to three-quarters of all of the people associated with the Watchtower 
in the early 20s are gone by 1931. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, you've just admitted this is a new truth about 1914, mm -hmm. ignoring what Russell had originally said and what was still being published in the books you were distributing around this time. Don't forget you're still yeah. circulating his books, mm -hmm. Russell's that is. But then this idea of stressing the name of Jehovah, who will honor Jehovah, and that everybody has the responsibility to be witnesses to this. Yeah. This is all new light. Even when it happens, you know, they they start making changes and then they, they divert your attention from all the things that failed previously. Yeah. All the dates that failed before 1925, all the things they were expecting to happen In that failed. Year. So so now yeah. they're they're giving you something new to to think about. Yeah, I, I got to think that if you were there, as William Schnell say was, mm -hmm. a, in the headquarters at this period in Germany, and you're seeing the, all this, you're thinking, well, this doesn't make any sense given that we still are, t are teaching officially in 1925 that Russell mm -hmm. is, the, is the faithful servant, the only one, one. Mm -hmm. And of course he changes that two or three years after this. But you're, you're talking about the year 1925 here, so it does look like you say that Rutherford is making a desperate ploy to draw attention away from the, the, from the false prophecy, 1925. Yeah. To something new. Yeah. doesn't help, though, that he's made a prediction for 25. But it is an example of, of um, mind control because the frequency with which something is said is going to penetrate people, mm -hmm. people's consciousness, and then they start thinking, well, yeah, I've heard it so many times, it must be true. Yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah. Now, they have cited, of course, here, only really two verses. They keep referring to Isaiah 43, 10 and 12, and how they were repeated over mm -hmm. and over again 46 times yeah. in five years. What happened to the rest of that text? Even yeah. the verse in between. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to read at least the immediate context of that for you to see why it is that these two verses are always singled out. Why they don't bother with 11 and, and what was around it. But, but I would say right off the bat, this statement that they say, Jehovah caused Isaiah to write, you are my witnesses. What would Isaiah have thought? Who would he think those witnesses were? It should be a question we ask whenever we read something. Who's this written to? Who's being spoken to? Is God tricking Isaiah? Because they, they later say all the applications are made to the Christian church. Yeah. So the question you yeah. must ask yourself whenever you're faced with a text, any text, any quote, is what would this have meant to the original audience, including the prophet who recorded it? Yeah. And, and you don't have to go very far in Isaiah 43 to figure that out. Yeah. Now, we're not going to do as much with this as we've done elsewhere, so we'll link, you to a, we'll link you to a prior video from the Proclaimers book where we discuss this in more detail. But right. just look at the immediate context here. From, the new, from their version, the New World Translation, let's read from Isaiah 43, 8 to 15. Okay. Bring out a people who are blind, though they have eyes and who are deaf, though they have ears. Let all the nations assemble in one place, and let the peoples be gathered together. Who among them can tell this? Or can they cause us to hear the first things? Let them present their witnesses to prove themselves right, or let them hear and say it is the truth. You are my witnesses, declares Jehovah. Yes, my servant, whom I have chosen, so that you may know and, and have faith in me and understand that I am the same one. Before me, no God was formed, and after me, there has been none. This is verse, uh, that was verse 10. Uh, verse 11, they don't uh, quote, right? So that is, I am Jehovah and beside me there is no Savior. Mm. Then they jump to 12. I am the one who declared and saved, and whom... Oh, they don't even have that part. I am the one who declared and saved and made known when there was no foreign God among you. So, and this is the part they quote, 
You are my witnesses, declares Jehovah, and I am God. Also, uh, this is 13 now. Also, I am always the same one, and no one can snatch anything out of my hand. When I act, who can prevent it? This is what Jehovah says, your repurchaser, the Holy One of Israel. For your sakes, I will send to Babylon and bring down all the bars of the gates and the Chaldeans in their ships will cry out in distress. I am Jehovah, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. So is it plain why you have to leave out many of these verses? It's, well, for sure. First of all, we've got to talk about the setting here. It's in many chapters in Isaiah, in this section of Isaiah, it's a court case. God's calling his witnesses to defend him against the claims of the foreign gods mm -hmm. and their devotees. Here, the Chaldeans are the dominant one, the Babylonians, right? Mm -hmm. But if you read the whole chapter, you realize that he's making a contrast as to why these people can be witnesses to his self ability to save. Yes. And notice that's cast in the por portion they leave out in the beginning of verse 12. That's cast in the past. I declared and saved and proclaimed. Mm -hmm. He saved them out of Egypt some 700 years before Isaiah writes these words, and he's going to save them out of Babylon. Yeah. The same people that are blind and deaf, he is going to save. Yeah. It's as plain as day if you read 42 and 43 of us. So they're not witnesses in the sense that you always think as a witness. It's talking. Mm -hmm. They're witnesses of the character of God. That's what shines out here, is that th this God can save them, and yes. this God can redeem them, and this God can forgive them. So this re Redeemer, Repurchaser, I think it is. Yeah. It? Repurchaser, Redeemer, Savior is mm -hmm. the one who has saved them already and will save them in the future. And their salvation is never because they are faithful people like non, like the pagans are not, not faithful and they are. That's not the issue. Yeah. The issue is he's elected them. He says that in verse 10. You are my servant whom I have chosen. Yeah. Notice it's I have chosen, not will choose at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the un unavoidable thing, if you just read the words, even in the New World Translation, is God is saying, I reserve to myself the right to choose who I want to use. Mm -hmm. You don't get to make the rules about who I use. Yeah. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, well, you're always in the position mm -hmm. of making the rules. It's up to you to be saved, and it's up to you to volunteer to be a witness. And it, and it's it's given you're given the impression that you're the one that vindicates God. Yeah. By your talking. No, God vindicates Himself by the way He is, and, and the, his what He does. Yeah. Is what vindicates Him. Not yeah. us. So we, we definitely suggest you read not just 43, but back into 42. Maybe read this whole section of Isaiah where it's very plain. Mm -hmm. that the word witness here is used in a technical sense. Mm -hmm. They are people who qualify the witness because they have actually seen nationally his salvation. And we'll see it again in the future. Yeah. Our mm -hmm. link, therefore, is going to be one of the earlier Proclaimers videos, right? Yes. Uh, it was the eighth one we did. It's what's missing from this passage about Isaiah 43, blind, deaf JWs. And we'll, we'll also link the, the Paradise playlist. I would, I would have to say, after reading this, that Jehovah's Witnesses are blind and deaf to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. they're, they're more interested in what the Witnesses tell them than what the Scriptures say. Yeah, I think this whole passage, these five paragraphs we just read, are a tribute to how powerful the Watar propaganda is. Yeah. It can blind you to the very fact that in your previous four decades of history, you knew nothing about these doctrines. And, and suddenly they were discovered. It wasn't of major importance, and, and now suddenly it is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. See you next time. Mm-hmm.